So to follow up on this point about how short-term memory and long-term memory are really just two different kind of sides of the same coin, we can really say that, you know, the brain is memory. And this is really, again, different from how a computer works. Uh, and one of the key differences about neurons versus computers is that uh, neurons have the memory and the processing kind of in the same place. So the synapses and the neuron structure of the neuron, all this tug of war, you know, action potential firing, that processing, all of that is kind of all there in individual neurons. And so you can't sort of separate out the memory from the processing, it's all intermixed. And so by the same token, you know, memory is not really a separate thing somewhere, again, some vast storehouse like we pictured in the movies. Um, there's a very nice scene of this in the movie Inside Out, uh, which is nevertheless a great movie, but um, very inaccurate representation of long-term memory. So the other thing that, that people love to do with memory is kind of classify and make these taxonomies. And this is always a, a thing that happens, you know, early on in a, in a particular scientific discipline. You know, step one is to kind of describe and figure out what's there, right? And, and that involves making these kind of ordered kind of taxonomies, organizing that knowledge of what's there. So like, you know, coming up with all these uh, kingdom and phyla and all that stuff with animal species. Um, and so people like to create those kinds of organizational structures per memory. And, you know, that's what leads you to think these are separate boxes. But uh, really, if you want to organize the, the memory systems of the brain, you really are just kind of reinventing the same uh, distinctions that we think about with processing, because processing and memory, again, are not separable. So ultimately, there's as many different types of memory as there are essentially neurons in your brain. If you really want to be a splitter, you can go all the way down, say this neuron has this kind of memory, this neuron has this kind of memory. Um, and it really isn't uh, that useful to kind of divide things up that much. But nevertheless, if you want to have a more uh, kind of broad scale, broad, broad brush stroke picture of how memory works, you have to just essentially see that it's exactly how the functional processing or areas are organized in the brain. That's where the memory is. So sensory memory that we talked about in the uh, modal model, again, is not surprisingly located in the sensory processing areas of your brain. Again, it is those neurons that are actually doing the visual processing, and it's the continued firing of those neurons that constitutes sensory memory. Short-term memory, actually, we think about in terms of uh, temporal lobe and the higher level semantic knowledge representations that we have in temporal lobe in terms of objects and people and places and things. Um, those kinds of things all get bound together uh, ultimately into the medial temporal lobe in the hippocampus. Um, and on the way, they're kind of represented as these kind of elements in temporal lobe. And uh, I believe we discussed earlier in chapter five how you're more consciously aware of information in the temporal lobes. You're not as consciously aware of what's going on in your parietal lobes. Part of that is because language is all here in the temporal lobes. It's things you can kind of describe and talk about. And so that tends to dominate what you can think about. Um, we have these kind of linguistic encodings in our minds. Um, and so uh, a lot of what we think of as kind of short-term memory, the, the part of memory that we're consciously aware of, this higher level knowledge is really reflecting activity in the temporal lobe. Prefrontal cortex also plays a really important role in stabilizing, maintaining, updating, and kind of interacting with those temporal lobe representations. Uh, and uh, there's another form of memory called working memory, which is often kind of confused with short-term memory. Um, it has that same kind of short-term characteristic, but it's a more robust kind of active form of memory that can be used in the face of interference. And so that um, is more specifically associated with frontal lobe activity. And we'll talk about that in chapter 10. Long-term memory is just everywhere. So that's just like, you know, depends on what you're talking about. Uh, is it your long-term memory for how to ride a bike? Is it your long-term memory for the meaning of the word, you know, a hot dog? Um, whatever, it's like, you know, some kind of, any piece of knowledge is encoded in synaptic weights, um, often distributed among many, many different neurons.
people are always trying to look for the engram in the brain, trying to say where is the unique location where some piece of knowledge is encoded, you know, this kind of mythical source of knowledge in your brain. Uh, and unfortunately, <laughs> for people who are trying to find that, um, it's everywhere, okay? So it's kind of this notion of a hologram. Uh, people who know about hologra how holography works, um, it's kind of the interference patterns that's encoded, encoded in a distributed way uh, in a hologram. And similarly, information and knowledge is very distributed across many, many different neurons. Every uh, network in the brain is kind of interconnected. They're all interacting. And when you're activating a given piece of knowledge, it involves the cooperative efforts of many, many neurons. And here, um, specifically, we'll, in this chapter, we'll be talking about uh, episodic memory. Uh, and when you thought about different types of memory, probably you thought mainly about this kind of memory. This is the most salient kind of thing when you think about, you know, these movies like Total Recall and uh, Blade Runner where, where these kind of, you know, very important questions of identity and, and, and the nature of these early memories that we have, the, the important kind of character building aspects also in Inside Out. Um, uh, you know, it's a very important theme of like how central memory is to our identity and our personality. And those memories, um, at least initially, were very much encoded in the hippocampus. Um, over time, if you have these really, you know, really important memories that you replay a lot and talk about with your family, etc., those can actually get then kind of distributed further out and, and, and become less dependent on the hippocampus for, their, uh, for your ability to retrieve them. Um, but uh, those are still that same kind of have that same characteristic of being kind of about your subjective personal experiences, first person kind of memories. Um, and uh, initial encoding of that is certainly in the hippocampus. And so we're going to focus a lot in this chapter on understanding what makes the hippocampus so special that it's it's specialized for this kind of memory. Why why that why is there a brain area? whose job it is kind of to do this form of episodic memory, and why can't the whole brain do that? What is special about the hippocampus? Um, in addition, there's uh, other areas surrounding the hippocampus that are particularly important for familiarity-based recognition. We actually won't look too much in detail about that. We don't have our familiarity model available for exploration here in the, in the textbook, um, but we have done work looking at uh, how changes in the uh, areas surrounding the hippocampus can support this kind of more vague sense of familiarity like uh, yeah I recognize that person but I just I don't know why I don't know why they're familiar but I have that feeling of familiarity uh, and then we'll also look at priming which is a kind of uh, very much more kind of cortically based form of memory um, that reflects um, small changes in synaptic weights and one of the things that's really interesting here is that uh, even just like the, the single trial, one exposure to an item can change the synaptic weights with just the standard kind of learning rates that we also use to accumulate knowledge over time. A little tweak to the weights, uh, to the synaptic weights can be enough to change your overall behavior in a way that kind of we can measure and that uh, is essentially what people talk about when they talk about priming. Things are kind of more easily activated. The pump is, the pump is primed. Um, and there's also a version of priming that uh, depends on residual activity. Again, an activation-based version of this same idea, and we'll also look at that. Uh, and activation-based priming, as you would expect, is kind of transient, whereas uh, weight-based priming can actually last for a surprisingly long time. Uh, in certain cases, it's been tracked out for years. Um, and again, that reflects these, the persistence of these little synaptic weight changes. So those are the main types of memory we'll be looking at in this chapter.